discussion with the congregation. In worship. And I, I thought because a lot of times that's kind of a confusion or people wonder why we're going to talk about that today. The first thing we're going to talk about is some of the history of uh, instrumental music and, and how these churches and churches across the world choose to not have instrumental music in worship. You might know that the word for unaccompanied music or non-instrumental music in worship or in any circumstance is called a cappella. Now, you may not know that the word cappella is the Italian word for church. This is a picture of the cappella Paoli at the Vatican. So the, the, word for, the word for church in Italian is cappella. Now, a cappella means in Italian the way of the church. So it was so common for unaccompanied music to be church music that the word we use for unaccompanied music is the literal word for in the manner of the church. Now the next thing I want us to, to look at is in early church history, no churches anywhere used instrumental music in worship. Uh, Clement, which was one of the church fathers early on, one of the bishops at Rome, this is what Clement of Alexandria said. He said, leave the pipe to the shepherd, the flute to the men who are in fear of God and are intent on idol worshiping. Such musical instruments, instruments must be excluded from our wine feeds, for they are more suited for these for the class of men that is less capable of reason than men. In general, we must completely eliminate every such base, sight, or sound in a word, everything immodest that strikes the senses, for this is an abuse of the senses. So as we look historically, Instrumental music, work, instrumental music wasn't used in churches anywhere until about 800 A.D. Now there are a couple of exceptions to that. Uh, Charlemagne of the Holy Roman Empire did incorporate uh, organ in his worship service, but it was later removed because of the controversy. controversy. The next thing, historically, you might, as you... As you uh, I, I say recently this group was popular. It's uh, the, I think the Benedictine monks. I might have that wrong. It's the Benedictine monks of Santo Domingo. This was a popular CD not too long ago. And if you heard that music, uh, the Gregorian chant, that, that is the kind of music that dates back to the earliest parts of Christianity, and it is completely a cappella. So, so as you look at the idea of, of worship and music and how that history came about, uh, a cappella music was the kind of music used in the church for the first 800 years of the church's history. As we move in from, from as the Reformation started and different kinds of churches were coming about and Martin Luther and Charles Wesley were bringing in and, and setting up churches that were different from, from Roman churches, it's interesting to know that all of these Reformation leaders supported a cappella worship. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, a, a, a great minister from London, said uh, David appears to have had particular tender remembrance of singing of the pilgrims, and assuredly the most delightful part of worship, and that which comes nearest to the adoration of heaven. What a degradation to supplant the intelligent song of the whole congregation by the theatrical prettiness of a quartet, the refined niceties of a choir, or the blowing off of wind from inanimate bellows and pipes. We just might as well pray by machinery as praise by. So understand, if you would have, have been in the United States in the, in the turn of the century, in the 1800s, before, any religion, any church you would have went, in, went to, uh, except for Roman churches at that time, you would have found them to be a cappella. Now, as that history unfolded, interesting enough, as you look at, at movies now, that they're being real accurate in portraying religion. And so as you go to the movies and you watch movies that portray religion before church services, before the Civil War, you'll notice that they portray them accurately. They do now portray them as a cappella worship. Uh, this is from the Chicago Times. It says... In a scene from Cold Ma Mountain, Ada and Eamon exchange glances from a hard wooden cues as they sing from their sacred harp hymnals. The congregation keeps time to a jubilant 
acapella tomb, rigid hands slicing to the air, strong voices lifted in praise. So if you go to the movies now, you'll notice that in these movies, that the movies are portraying historical worship accurately. They are portraying it as acapella. And I realize all this history is extremely boring, and I just wanted to bring it out before we got into the text of our lesson. Let's turn to John chapter 4, verse 19. Samaritan woman was saw Jesus. Jesus asked her if he could borrow something to get some water with. She, she said, you're going to ask me, a Samaritan woman, to borrow something from you to get water? And, and she was surprised that Jesus treated her so well. Jesus told her about the fact that she was living in sin. And, and here we pick up the story, John chapter 4, verse 19. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that it is in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said, For a woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those that worship them must worship them in spirit and in truth. The, the woman was a Samaritan, and they worshiped in a different place than the Jewish people worship. And she asked Jesus about this controversy. She says, my family worships on this mountain. You people say that in Jerusalem is the place we ought to worship. And she was asking Jesus which one was right. But Jesus said that the hour is coming and now is where true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. <coughs> that that was going to change. That the worship of the Old Testament was going away. Now you might remember that the worship of the Old Testament was instrumental. There were instruments and David used the harp. But as we look at the scripture, we see that worship was going to change at the when Jesus Christ came into the world. Jesus Christ was going to bring in a new type of worship. The worship was going to be different in the fact that this worship would be based in spirit. He says that they would worship in spirit and in truth because that's what God seeks to be his worshipers. Worshiping, worshiping God would be something done with the heart, connecting with God, following God. Let's turn to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, now I understand the idea of being a Christian is to be different, not, not to be the same as the world. Now, and here, Paul gives me church this job. It says to be different from the world, to not be conformed to this world. Uh, you might have been watching in the, the news lately, uh, there was a church in Corpus Christi, Texas. They, they made headlines for their Easter service because they gave away big screen TVs and cards, cars, and let's see, it says big screen TVs, cars, and furniture, and, and gift certificates <laughs> at their ser Easter service to get more people in. I, I'd like to to caution you and just kind of apologize for not giving away cards today. <laughs> we see that in religion, religion is becoming worldly every day. Doing things, competing with the world, not trying to be different. And understand, the way that we, we become, we show people that God is real, the way people, we show people that the church is real by being different from the world. And as those differences disappear, people don't see the church as being Christ. As the church becomes worldly, the light of the church disappears. 
So here in John, Jesus told the Samaritan woman, he said that worship was going to change. It was going to be different. The worship was going to be in spirit and in truth. And he tells us, and Paul tells us in Romans, he says, don't be worldly in your worship. Right? In anything you do. But our job isn't to be like the world. Our job isn't to compete with the world. Our job is to shine and be different from the world. So we, we look back in history and we see that in the 1800s and in 800 AD there was this shift to instrumental music. But then again in the 1800s there was a shift to instrumental music. We have to ask ourselves why that happened. What they were trying to accomplish. And ask yourself why this congregation chooses not to go that way. Why this congregation in a world, in a modern world, chooses to have very simple worship. Acapella worship. Let's turn to uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 22. Great job teaching school, or you're doing a great job working at the bank, or whatever that is. That's 
what praise is. He tells us here that God who created the world is not worshipped with human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. When you're giving sacrifices to God, you're giving presents to God, it's important to give thought to what God wants, what God asks for. God asks us to be part of our life is to be praised. Part of our life, taking time to proclaim how wonderful he is, how great he is, how much he's changed for our life. And interesting enough, here in Acts chapter 17, Paul was talking to the people and he says, you know, when you bring things to God, bring them simply. He says, God that created the world and everything isn't, isn't worshipped by human hands. Let's go to Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called, in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, dwell in the name of the Lord, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Now, when we're just wanting to simply obey God, we're just wanting to do what God tells us to do, he tells us to sing. He tells us here, he says... Let the word of Christ rich, richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to the Lord. But when God looks at us, he looks within and sees our heart. My, my dad, I grew up, my dad isn't that talented of, a, talented of a singer. My mom is a beautiful singer. My mom sings and it's just amazing, but my dad sings and not, I mean, God's within a three-mile radius and I cocked their head in pain. <laughs> I sat between them my whole childhood. So, you know, if you like my singing or don't like it, understand, you know, it's in between. <clears throat> when God hears praise, he doesn't hear quality. He hears the heart. He, he's not listening for a melody. You know, I, I like music. You know, sometimes that perfect song comes on the radio and I'm going to go along around the block another time just so I can hear the rest of it. But understand what God wants is our heart. He, he says singing and making melody with your hearts, thankfulness in your hearts to God. The instrument God wants us to use is our heart. That's what God wants us to praise with. That's what God wants us to use to praise him. And, and you know, kids can tell if your heart felt in your praise when you're telling your child you, he did a wonderful job. They know if you're sincere or not. <laughs> they don't need a whole lot of drama to it. They just want to be told. God asks us to tell him, to praise him, to sing songs to one another and praise him and tell him how wonderful he is. We can do that simply. You don't need to even be in the church building to do that. You can be driving down the road, and, and you know, the people driving beside you won't even know that you're not singing to the radio if you're singing praise to God. <coughs> but singing praise to God is something you do with your heart. That's the instrument God chooses to have us use. Throughout all history, slowly religion has changed. It started out with real simple praise, and slowly... Praise has become more complicated, and instruments were added. But if we get down to the simplest thing of just telling God how wonderful He is, it's a wonderful thing to praise God. And God just asked us to sing. In the Old Testament, there were instruments of worship. If you look at Psalm 66, you see instruments of worship mentioned in that psalm. But here, but when Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman, she told, he told her that the time was coming when worship would change. The time was coming when worship would be in spirit and in truth. And he told them, he told her that worship would be different. It would be more spiritual. It would be more truthful. 
As we look for that desire to have our worship be spirit and in truth, we look at the scripture and we ask you the New Testament, what does God ask us to do? Let's just do that. God just asks us to sing. Praise Him. Let's turn to uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. continually offer up the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. And do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. You know, as we look at a world where religion is changing, I never thought I would see the day when they would give away cars at a raffle at church. I never really thought of that as a possibility. I, I think they were even like Jaguars and stuff. It'd kind of be hard not to go. <laughs> Get a new car off. I never thought I would see that day. And as we see churches slowly become worldly, we need to cement our ideals. Let's just do what the Bible says. He tells us here to let us offer up a sacrifice to God that is the fruit of lift. With, with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Have you ever seen that kiss written out somewhere of Adrian Smith? Adrian, I about said Smith, but it's now I forgot his name. It's Adrian, but it's different. <laughs> he preaches. And actually, it's Jim Casey and Adrian, Michigan. I'm going to get this right. Jim Casey and Adrian, Michigan. His wife told me one time they just got back from the youth rally. She was tired and exhausted, and it was time for evening worship. And, and she said she walked up on the chalkboard beside the pulpit and wrote kiss before the sermon. The whole congregation thought, what a loving wife. She walked up there and wrote, walked up there and wanted her husband to have see her write kiss before the sermon. She thought that he the congregation thought that was a loving, affectionate gesture. Jim Casey looked at it and knew it means keep it simple, stupid. She was tired, ready to go home. I don't think I'd say stupid. But so often in history, religion became, becomes complicated and misses the mark. What we need to try to do, what we need to accomplish as we search the scriptures and ask what God desires from us in worship, what God desires from us in preaching, what God desires, desires from us as Christians, as saints, as elders, as deacons, God desires us to simply obey. Keep it simple. Don't make it complicated. Don't make it worldly. People tend to complicate things. People tend to make things worldly. And that's not what God desires. Keep it simple. So this congregation chooses to have a very simple worship. A very simple worship where we come together on the first day of the week to remember. Remember a long time ago that Jesus Christ came to this world and, and he told us about heaven. He told us about everlasting life. He told us about grace and how we can have our sins forgiven. That a long time ago Jesus Christ came to the world and he died for us. And he was resurrected. And we come to here and, and we remember the communion. We remember that resurrection. And we praise God with our voice, simply. And in a world where things are complicated, in a world where you need semi-trucks to bring the equipment to praise God, we don't. I wonder how much money we save for that simple choice. We choose to worship God simply, to praise Him with the fruit of our lips, just like He asked in the New Testament. And thank you, believe the story of God. Believe the story of Jesus Christ, that he came to this world, he, he died and was resurrected. If you believe that story, it's, it's time to confess him before people. It's time to repent of your sins. It's time to be baptized in this year. Come forward. Follow away. I'm
Oh, <laughs> 